Well, good morning. <laughs> I love the title of the song that they just shared with us. I can see clearly now because that's what we're really all about here at Unity, learning how to see clearly, learning to see truth, capital T. We have to unlearn a lot of our childish ideas about what the world is and how it works and who we are and learn to mature spiritually and understand really true wisdom. So seeing clearly is seeing the truth. We've all been so programmed by TV and parents and teachers and preachers and everyone and, and learned people and scientists and people whose brains tell us certain things, but that's not necessarily wisdom. We spend the first part of our life learning what great brains of the world teach us about reality. Hopefully we spend the next part of our lives learning what the great minds of the world teach. That is truth or eternal wisdom. Ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set thee free. What does that mean exactly? Well, for one thing, it means that we can see truth clearly, and in so doing, we can free ourselves from much suffering and establish in our lives peace and joy and love in our lives. So what is this truth, capital T, that can set us free? Truth is seeing life without prejudices, without blinders, without programming, our old programming, without our faulty lenses that muddy the waters of reality and make us suffer as a result. It's about not projecting our fears of snakes, for example, on the road. You know my favorite uh, Buddhist story. Not projecting our fear of snakes on sticks on the road and then reacting to the stick as if it were a terrifying venomous snake and having a heart attack and dying. We, of course, I know some of you have heard this a hundred times, it's my favorite one, because we, of course, do that all the time. We are projecting our programming, our fears, our neuroses, and our faulty ideas on absolutely everything in our lives and we often suffer greatly because of it. When we see truth, capital T, that the sticks in our lives aren't snakes, we're free. It's like realizing that that rude, rejecting person in the hall who didn't speak to you, maybe even your boss, uh, because they didn't see you, because they were so lost in their own neuroses, it's realizing that the vengeful, negative, hurtful people in your life are really crying out for your love, or maybe that they were your beloved children in a past life who are now working out their karma with you. It is perhaps like a teacher who thinks that students have never been worse. I deal with this one all the time. Recalcitrant, spending their time partying on the weekends instead of studying or just being lazy. You want them all to make A pluses, but they're just not doing it. And you think, oh, it's never been so bad. And then you read Plato, who said the same exact thing about his students in the symposium back in ancient Greece, almost word for word, what teachers talk about in the faculty lounge. It's perhaps realizing that this world that we sometimes are sure has never been in greater danger is in reality much safer than it's ever been. We don't have marauding neighboring tribes attacking our settlements on a weekly basis. We don't have Vikings attacking and completely pillaging our cities every spring. We don't even have Bonnie and Clyde and outlaw types terrorizing the Wild West anymore. Despite what the media feeds us to line their own pockets, our lives have become far safer, more harmonious, and freer of chaos and suffering. Rarely does someone die of starvation in America, and rarely are whole neighborhoods robbed and pillaged. Rarely are people jailed because some nobleman or king disliked something that he said. 
there are no debtor's prisons anymore. Despite uh, what we're being told, the world has gotten safer. A critical mass of people even have actually committed their lives to becoming spiritually aware. Their spiritual lives are number one. This is happening so fast right now. Free means seeing things as they really are, often just neutral events and people who our projections make into things to fear, dislike, or feel negative about. This negativity and lack of love and forgiveness make us suffer and sometimes make us sick with dis-ease, like cancer due to the stress that it creates, stress being the necessary common denominator of all diseases. And we certainly all know how it feels when we are unforgiving, vengeful, and unloving. We create an atmosphere in us, around us, in our lives that is chaotic and just downright uncomfortable to live in. Freedom means understanding ourselves and others in a new way that helps us not feel negativity toward them or ourselves. When we understand that they, like we, are all perfect divine beings, albeit sometimes confused by the ways of the world, we start to see others and ourselves in whole new ways. We all have program reactions from time to time, and that's really nothing to feel guilty about. The smart way to handle it would be to just note the programmed reactions when we have them and to look at the programs little by little, and then we'll be able to see faster and faster in the future how reactionary we have been and how much suffering it has caused us. We'll see how we have been stimulus response machines. We want to be more than a machine. Even the Dalai Lama, talking about not feeling guilty, even the Dalai Lama is apparently occasionally affected. This week I talked to a Buddhist applicant for the job of headmaster at the school where I teach. He's had a couple of private meetings with the Dalai Lama. He's Buddhist, and when I asked him about it, he said that at the last meeting that he had with the Dalai Lama, he said, Dalai Lama was in a bad mood. <laughs> It seems that President Obama had refused to meet with him when he was in Washington. Obama was on his way to meet with the Chinese uh, communists in his, on his China trip, and he knew that it would be diplomatically unsuitable to meet with the Dalai Lama before he went because there were so many tense relations between the co Chinese communists and uh, the, the Tibetans. Chinese communists being extremely anti-Tibetan, of course. Anyway, it apparently meant a lot to the Dalai Lama to meet with Obama, and he had just received notice right before their meeting that he had been turned down and could not discuss the Tibetan issue with Obama. My friend said the Dalai Lama was visibly upset and not in a good mood. He said that as their conversation continued, though, that the Dalai Lama obviously got control of himself and reverted back to the giggly, loving man that we all know. The point is that we're all human. Even the Dalai Lama, who is now considered by statistics to be the number one spiritual figure in the world. We are all capable of learning to quickly get free of some of our stimulus response reactions, like the Dalai Lama did. It didn't take him but minutes, apparently. It usually takes us a little longer. I've wallowed in some negative reactions for years. I suspect that the Dalai Lama quickly noticed that he was reacting, realized how his programming was influencing him, and applied certain Buddhist techniques to start seeing clearly how not to let all those old tapes run in his mind and affect him. We are told in all spiritual teachings that we too can get free of our old patterns, that we too can start seeing through maya or illusion and thus realize the love, harmony, joy, and health that are everywhere to be enjoyed. 
That is a lot of knowing what the truth is that sets us free. And the second term that needs to be defined in ye shall know the truth and the truth shall set thee free is truth, capital T. Truth has been around since time immemorial. We know at Unity and we often say that no one religion has a monopoly on truth because truth has been inherent in our universe long before the first established religion. Since the beginning of time, as a matter of fact, truth is found in all religions and spiritual philosophies, but it is often surrounded by other man-made ideas so that it is up to us to discover what part of those religions represent real truth and what, uh, man is, what part is really relevant for man. Because certain cultures and at certain times in history, uh, they have added certain things around that truth that have kind of obscured it. I don't think they meant to hide it, but it got obscured. The, uh, Unadulterated truth also can be taken literally if we don't know how to read some of these spiritual teachings. For example, the Bible says, I love this one, unto him that hath it shall be given. If we take that profound thought literally, it would be spiritually ludicrous. It would say to only help those who don't need it, give unto those who already have it. Only the wealthy would deserve help. The true spiritual meaning of unto him that hath it shall be given is that those who have already worked on themselves spiritually will recognize higher truths and be able to take in more when it is offered them. Truth isn't an intellectual commodity. It's wisdom that prepares us to take in even more profound truths. So what is truth? I'm sure that no two people would totally agree on this, but I'd like to share with you, excuse me, some basic ideas that I have on the subject, <clears throat> since it seems like a lot of you have been asking me lately, well, what is truth? And you deserve an answer, at least an answer. So what is truth, capital T, the truths that are inherent in all spiritual systems, if properly understood? the eternal truths. Well, one, all life is one. Everything is one. There is only, as we say every Sunday, one power and one presence in the universe, and that is God, the omnipotent, the divine. And we are all part of this divine oneness. Many people think that this basic unity tenet is strictly Eastern. And given Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore's studies of Eastern texts and things like his exposure to the guru Yogananda in California, that would make sense. But the fact is that Fillmore and thousands of other New Thought adherents know that this idea is also Christian, at least as Christianity was originally taught. Jesus in the New Testament Krishna in the Hindu Bhagavad Gita, Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching, to mention but a few, all said essentially what Jesus said. I and the Father are one, and told us that we too are one with the all. They all taught that the things they did, we can do also, and that we should if we want to have life and have it more abundantly. They tried to help us see clearly that we are all one with the divine, the all, God. Christ consciousness is what Jesus, the man, attained and urged us to strive for too. And it's not really something to strive for because the oneness is already our natural state. It's a matter of developing our awareness of it so that we can manifest the attributes in our lives. Love, compassion, forgiveness, joy, and harmony. 
Our programming would often have us think otherwise about ourselves, and then we automatically react to situations accordingly with negativity, judgment, vengeance, fear, all which create our suffering, the result of being out of sync with the harmony that is. We run around making snakes out of all those sticks on the road of life, and we react to these self-imposed snakes by suffering. Two, the second truth is that there is another way of thinking and living than that which we have been in programmed for, that we have all inherited. This involves a higher level of reality that can be attained and has been attained by great masters like Jesus, who have clearly told us that it is possible. Ye are gods, it says in the Bible. The Bible and all spiritual teachings, if understood correctly, lead us to this higher order of being. Third, is that we are all the chosen ones. We can all live on that higher level of reality, which involves fully developing as a human being. It's up to us. This means rising above our natural animal program natures. It means being more than a stimulus response machine, albeit perhaps a highly functioning one in a worldly sense. The potential to be a higher being helps us be a fully functioning, fully evolved human who has overcome worldly tendencies to react in ways that cause us suffering for, to ourselves and to others. Not necessarily, they're not talking about this self-restraint or sacrifice, which rarely works, but through wisdom, the wisdom that tells us that it is the same comfortable, peaceful way to live for us and for everyone around us. Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore says that it's realizing that, and I quote, every thought of mind, every atom of body, every molecule of being, every function of nature, and every force is divine, and that all these vibrate to the harmonies of spirit. This is the resurrection of our being into higher levels. And again, it's not developing that function. It's already there, hardwired in us. It's more a matter of realizing it by stripping away all of our thoughts to the contrary and then living our heavenly inheritance. The manifestation being peace, prosperity, perfection, and power. Ye are gods. The Christian and Hindu Bibles, Sufi mysticism, the Tao, all say the same thing. Truth is everywhere. Question, so how do we transform ourselves? Answer, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The great Bibles, sutras, and teachings don't tell us to go anywhere or achieve some great feat. They tell us to change our minds, to align our minds with truth, and then to live truth, to be truth. Through true prayer, which is yoga or union with the divine, Fillmore tells us that we start sloughing off, doing away with the parts of our consciousness that do, are not in accord with the higher principles. It's like the planting of a seed in the ground. The seed dies so that it can bring forth new life. The acorn gets rid of its bondage, of its acornness, and becomes a new form, the grand oak tree. This transfiguration is a, an essential step in becoming a new being. We can't be a mighty oak when we hang on to our acornness. We must renew our minds. Four, 
Concomitant, concomitant with the third truth is the fourth one. We live in an illusion, maya, unless we make the effort to see clearly. You can see clearly now. You can. Again, back to the theme of Katrina's beautiful song, I can see clearly now that she sang. That's what the Bible is referring to when it says, when I was a child, I thought as a child and acted as a child. I saw through a glass darkly, but now see face to face. It's back to my favorite Buddhist story about the man projecting his snake phobia onto the stick, panicking and dying of a heart attack due to his fear. All life, of course, being like that when we're not careful. We constantly project our mental stuff onto reality and create illusions, maya, and then we are constantly reacting to those illusions and we're suffering. One of the great truths is that we can gain clarity, the ability to see all things as they really are, not as our projected fears, neuroses, paranoias, and faulty programming are portraying them to us. We see the truth of what things really are. The words that offend us are just sound waves. The people we see as problems are just atoms. We create our world with our minds. Gurdjieff said that the point is to see so clearly that nothing comes between us and what is seen. No prejudices, no programming, no paranoia, no clouds of illusion. Seeing clearly is seeing the illusions or maya that we have created. The truth is that it's all Brahman or God, divine or Yahweh, whatever you want to call the force or divinity, the only force in divinity in the universe. It's all divine perfection. And five, and that segues into really the fifth truth, the atom smashing power of the mind that we talked about last week. Unity co-founder Charles Fillmore says that our minds create our world. The Course of Miracles, Buddhism and Hinduism agree. The Bible says, as a man thinketh, so he is. Fillmore takes it a step further though and says that we actually have the power to use our minds to manifest whatever we want by a change in our thinking or perception. When Jesus said, I and the Father are one, he meant that he was one with truth, capital T. And by telling us that we can do these things that he did and greater, he was telling us that we should and can use our minds to understand and become one with eternal wisdom. In sum, truth isn't some secret knowledge, some other thing to know. It is something that we must become one with. When it is experienced and lived, we know it's true. So union with truth allows us to understand it. The Taoist writings say that the scholars of the highest class hear about Tao or truth and carry it into practice. Scholars of the middle class hear about it and then sometimes carry it into their lives and retain it, but sometimes lose it. Scholars of the lowest class hear about truth and laugh greatly at it. In the East, a man's knowledge, and particularly his self-knowledge, is regarded as being dependent not on his intellectual cleverness, but on his being. And so it is with truth. We can know what it is intellectually and miss the entire point. Or we can know it and sometimes follow it and sometimes not, and so lose it. Or we can become truly it. We can become the truth and by so doing, truly understand it. In closing, it is possible to see clearly, to see truth. The Bible's 
sutras, spiritual teachings of the world from before the Egyptian mystery schools have been textbooks of absolute truth, though veiled in symbols and understood only at one time by the illumined, as Fillmore tells us. And the illumined are those who have chosen to be the teachings. I and many others agree with Fillmore that the vibratory level of modern man is changing to a higher rate. We are more ready to unfold now spiritually than ever before a critical mass of people. He says that we need only listen to our inner voice, cultivate the good, the pure, the God within us. We must not let our false beliefs keep us in darkness. We can begin to see clearly and find the new Jerusalem in us, to use a Western term. Taoists call it cultivating the Tao. Hindus call it self-realization. The Buddhists call it enlightenment. The Zen Buddhists call it satori. But the concept and methods are all very similar. In order to reach this goal, progress must be made simultaneously in the areas of knowledge and being. And progress, progress along one line must always keep pace with progress on the other. Thus, truth is not just knowledge. It is merging knowledge and being, our knowledge and our being. And that is one of the greatest secret teachings or truths known to man. The one which we work with tirelessly at, for at Unity, helping ourselves and each other be the truth, not just know it. In fact, by being it, we can know it. Amen.